Great. So our last speaker of the day is uh, Dan Donahan. I'll we'll be talking about the De Broly wave. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, hear me all right? Okay. Is that on? Yeah, that's good. Should be fine now. So I'm putting this in my pocket, but you can still hear me. Um, so uh, I agree with the last speaker about one thing, and that is that uh, wave mechanics is a mess. Um, the uh, the De Broglie wave uh, has a superluminal velocity that becomes infinite as the particle comes to rest. And Schrodinger himself saw the problems with the wave functions that come out of the hydrogen atom, uh, which he said seemed to describe not an individual trajectory, but a snapshot of the camera shutter, op shutter open of all possible trajectories. So this led to the probabilistic interpretation of quantum mechanics, which has led in turn to all the problems that we refer to compendiously as the measurement problem. Um, well, I want to take this all back to 1924 and suggest that a lot of the problems of quantum mechanics have arisen because the de Broglie wave was misinterpreted um, and misinterpreted before the Solvay conference of uh, 1927. So I think things were already in a mess at that stage. Uh, at least that's what I'm going to argue. So um, I asked uh, that well-known uh, expert on information theory, chat GT, GPT, about this. Um, and I was informed with... Uh, Chat GPT didn't really tell me much. Um, uh, you can check it out for yourself. But what it did say was with great confidence, and you can be sure that if you have students and you ask them to write essays on the De Broglie wave, they're going to say this. They're going to say it's not a wave at all. It's a fundamental or mathematical concept. And the examples of... Uh, fundamental concept that uh, uh, the chatbot gave were force, mass, and energy. So, so I agree that um, with, with chatbot, I'm glad to say, um, and it's important because apparently the way chatbot works is to, um, from a vast number of uh, authorities that it can access instantly, it looks for a consensus. So I, I like to think that it's reporting a consensus when it says that the uh, De Broglie wave is not a wave at all. But, of course, fundamental concept doesn't get us very far. It doesn't explain uh, the very curious nature of the Schrodinger wave functions. And um, it doesn't explain why a massive particle interacts and evolves as if it were a wave. And it does do that. It's got a, um, it's got a phase. It's it's got a wavelength. It's got a frequency. And when you look at the Born probabilities that are observed in the interference of um, two of these waves, they correspond very. They correspond exactly with the intensities observed in the interference of classical waves. So, let's suppose that. The De Broglie wave is not a wave. And in that case, I think the question that needs to be answered is what kind of thing, fundamental concept or mathematical concept or thing that is not a wave could induce a massive particle to act like a wave? Um, and I believe the real clue to this is the velocity of the De Broglie wave which um, becomes infinite, as I said, as the particle comes to rest. And this is the key point. 
that's not the behaviour of any true energy or information transporting wave, but it's typical of the phase modulation of an underlying carrier wave. So that's what I'll argue and demonstrate that the De Broglie wave is simply a relativistically induced phase modulation, essentially a distortion induced in the structure of the particle by the failure of simultaneity. Um, so what, what is a, uh, the easiest way to explain what a relativistically induced phase modulation is, is with the example of a standing wave. So um, now, now I, I've got to explain one thing that uh, I tried to swap this uh, memory here with another one. These arrows are reversed and they seem to be disobeying me every time I, I go into uh, PowerPoint. And uh, um, so there's a standing wave. Every part of it's going up and down at the same time. But if you were moving, but if it was moving to the right, you would see the beginnings of a phase modulation. The bits to the right are going up and down later than those to the left. And, and this is very well established experimentally, and it's established every minute of every day in the uh, in the satellites of the global positioning systems um, the uh, so the two things are happening here one is that the thing is contracted and the other is that a phase modulation is beginning and at sufficiently high up velocities the modulation takes the form of a sinusoidal wave um, so um, this isn't a new idea, and, and I'll explain a bit more about that in a minute. But you can already see, I think, um, and I should also say that this thing here, this uh, sinusoid, is is moving with the velocity of the Broglie wave. It has the wavelength of the Broglie wave, and it has the frequency of the Broglie wave. So, um, so, and you should also be able to see a number of other things. First of all, why the velocity becomes infinite when the wave comes to rest in the rest frame of the wave, and that's because the velocity of a phase modulation is the velocity with which phase changes from one point to the next along the wave, and where the velocity is where the phase is the same everywhere, the change is instantaneous and the velocity is infinite. You can also see the role of the wave in interference. Um, when two of these waves, maybe in self-interference or in the interference of two separate particles, you'll observe that interference on a beam splitter uh, and the wave will present to the beam splitter with the sinusoidal um, form, in the size sinusoidal form. So the interference will depend on whether these sinusoids are in or out of phase with one another. Um, and the, the other thing that you would see if this is an explanation of the de Broglie wave, that it's no longer in this explanation, it's not necessary to have a separate particle and wave because the wave and particle are ontologically the same thing. The, um, the, the wave is just a distortion in the underlying fabric, underlying structure of the particle. Um, so this, this immediately, uh, Includes a number of um, explanations of, of uh, like there are, th are theories in the double solution theory and the pilot wave theory in which uh, De Broglie tried to construct a particle from superpositions of De Broglie waves. 
But if this is the answer, if this is the explanation of the de Broglie wave, the de Broglie, the particle becomes ontologically prior to the wave, and 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 so that effectively excludes all other possible all all those other possibilities. Um, it's also ontologically, or sorry, it's also theoretically parsimonious because it requires only a Lorentz transformation. Um, it's just a, a natural effect that occurs as a result of special relativity when you observe a particle from another frame of reference. Um, so that, as a, that wasn't de Broglie's interpretation of his wave, but it is consistent with the preference that he had, and this lasted many years, for a wave mechanics in which the particle has a defined location and trajectory, uh, as in those theories that I just mentioned. And nor is it a, a new interpretation. It has a, it, it, it seems to have started with uh, an American professor of physics called Milo Wolf about 30 or 40 years ago. And it has a literature which I've listed in this reference here. Um, but the, but the trouble, and I'll make two arguments uh, in favor of uh, this. So the trouble, the trouble with this literature is that people who come up with the idea that the de Broglie wave is simply a modulation, they, they invariably go on to try and construct a theory from this, a theory of the structure of matter. But two problems. One is that these theories usually don't make too much sense, or at least they haven't caught on. And, and the other problem is that this is a really a big job. It's a job for the standard model. Um, and uh, in view of all those unknown parameters in the standard model, we're going to have to wait a while to find out what a, what a particle really is. I'm going to argue that this interpretation precludes any other explanation of the de Broglie wave. And it is also the interpretation that emerges from de Broglie's own thesis of 1924. And that's the first thing I'll discuss is the thesis. So, excuse me, I'm dry. So de Broglie started with uh, two, um, these two equations of Einstein associated with Einstein, the Planck-Einstein relation, uh, E equals H nu, and Einstein's the e equals mc squared. And, um, and from this, he, in, he deduced the frequency, which has gone missing there. And the frequency is nu equals mc squared over H. And he proposed that the particle must be surrounded in its rest frame by a periodic phenomenon. Um, he, 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 he didn't, he, the, the big question uh, that arises is that what is this frequency? What is this oscillation? Um, and, and what he said regarding this is very important. Um, and if you read what I've uh, put there, de Broglie said, um, and what he explains there is that it's, it, it can't be a internal oscillation because the fields of the electron spread through all space. And he made it clear that it's also an oscillation that exists in the rest frame of the particle. And if you think about it, how can you have a wave, an ordinary wave, that exists in one frame and not another? Um, so, so he said that, but then he, he provided no details of his, of his, uh, this thing he called a, a, a periodic, periodic phenomenon. And he explained right in the last paragraph of the thesis that this omission was intentional 
because his theory wasn't precise. He left it intentionally vague. Um, and, I, and I think this is where quantum mechanics has gone wrong. Um, and if you want to check this, all this is in the first chapter of his thesis, which is only eight pages long. The only other thing you need to read is the, the paragraph about it being vague, which occurs in the very last paragraph. It's the very last paragraph of the thesis. So if, if you imagine that De Broglie had, had in fact supplied a mathematical description, um, uh, So I've got to explain that this um, memory stick I'm using is an old one. It was amended twice. And because I didn't have internet, I couldn't put the latest one on. But that periodic phenomenon is followed by a, it's not followed there, is it? No. It's followed by an exponential e to the minus wt. And back here in the bottom, if you Lorentz transform this, you get this thing followed by the de Broglie wave, E to the I to the WT minus kappa X. Um, so it's a bit embarrassing to say that uh, he, he noticed it and I haven't got it, but, um, but he would have noticed that he had produced the um, de Broglie wave not as a independent wave, but as a modulation. So you can see the first factor, which is there, is that because of the little gamma there, you can see it's um, relativistically, relativistically contracted. And you can see from the VT that it's moving at the velocity of the boost. So it's moving at the velocity of the particle in that frame of reference. Um, so I would argue that because because that because of the generality of that formula, the the Lorentz transformation induces the De Broglie wave in solid matter, whatever the form of that solid matter, um, however it's formed, no matter what the uh, nature of the forces, no matter what's holding it together, no matter what's causing it to interact with other particles, no matter what uh, symmetries it has, no matter the the origin of its parity and uh, charge and all those other properties of matter, the fact that a moving particle is observed to have a distortion in it that corresponds to the De Broglie wave precludes all other um, explanations of the De Broglie wave. Um, so, um, but you can still ask why? Why? Why would? Why would a, the Lorentz transformation induce in solid matter a um, a De Broglie wave? And and the answer to that, I think, is that. Um, is the combined effect of the Lorentz transformation and the Planck-Einstein relation. The Lorentz transformation implies that the consistory forces of matter, consistory influences of matter, no matter, no matter what they are, evolve at the velocity c. And that all other velocities must therefore be compositionally and exis existentially dependent on c. I mean, there are other velocities, obviously, the velocity of solid matter and the velocity of refracted, refracted light, but these must be in some way um, existentially dependent on C. Well, the Planck-Einstein relation implies that such influences of velocity C must have the characteristic frequency of the particle in question. So I think what all this implies is that a massive particle must be, in some sense, must simulate, must act like, or must be a 
standing wave. Um, now, de Broglie had no mathematical description of his periodic phenomenon. If you look in the thesis, you'll see he he derived the um, he had nothing to Lorentz transform, so he turned to a different problem. And you really need to read this part of the thesis very carefully, but where, whereas before he was considering an extended wave, an extended periodic phenomenon, he just turns to a single point in that phenomenon and compares the frequency of the stationary particle with that of a a moving particle. So what is what he asks is what form of wave would remain in phase with a moving and oscillating point? And the answer he got was an independent wave. But I believe that what he derived was not a wave at all. It wasn't even a modulation of a wave. It was just the history or record of the evolution in space and time of a moving and oscillating point. And this is, this is all you need, this is all he needed to, um, to explain the, the um, this is all he needed to, to explain the uh, trajectories of the Bohr atom. Um, and it's all, for instance, that uh, Feynman needs in, a Feynman, uh, in his Feynman path integral theory. Um, so De Broglie gave two other examples, two other demonstrations or illustrations of his, his um, De Broglie wave. And this one here is an array of springs. Um, and he, he showed that when it's moving at a relativistic velocity, a sinusoid appears in it. But um, he he did this for the purpose of uh, simply showing that something that evolves at the at a, at a velocity greater than light need not necessarily be inconsistent with special relativity. But but what he also showed he showed that to that end that this thing is moving at superluminal velocity. This you can see it must move at superluminal velocity because. Because when it's stationary, the the sinusoid is moving in the phase is changing um, instantaneously. Um, but but what he's drawn here is 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 a what I've drawn here because he didn't actually put a drawing in his thesis. What I've what I've drawn here is a standing wave, and what this sinusoid is is the modulation phase modulation of a standing wave. Um, so his other demonstration was in Minkowski space time, and he he these blue light blue lines here, which, these light blue lines are what he called equiphase planes, and they represent the um, they represent uh, different points in time where. The phase has repeated itself. They could be, for instance, peaks or or troughs in the wave. But what he has here is is not a point. It's a standing wave. If you return this to its rest frame, he's drawn a standing wave. So his modulation is again his his De Broglie wave is again not an independent wave. It's a modulation. Um, So, um, so I gave a talk about this last month at a meeting at the Sorbonne, um, which was the hundredth anniversary of De Broglie's three papers that De Broglie wrote. And somebody there informed me afterwards that in 1926, two years after his thesis, he did write down a mathematical description of his periodic phenomenon. And unlike mine, it's still got the oscillation in it. And then he he uh, he he referred it to it as a standing wave, and he subjected it to a Lorentz transformation, and he obtained a um, 
he, he obtained a a, tr a, a, tr a carrier wave plus modulation, and he but he didn't recognise it. He he didn't he didn't he doesn't examine it. He um, and one reason for that is that the modulation he wrote down is not in the usual form of the de Broglie wave, and he just describes the carrier wave as a as an amplitude without examining its spatial extension, and he 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 just doesn't seem to notice it. But he but there he wrote it down. He wrote it down as a modulation, um, and so that was pointed out to me by Aurelier Duzay of the. Um, of the French National Institute of Scientific Research at Grenoble. Um, so if the de Broglie wave is only one wave factor in a composite wave, it's, it's only a modulation of, of, of something else, you might ask, why should it be so important? Um, and that's because the modulation through the Planck-Einstein relation and the de Broglie relation defines the evolving phase of the particle and thus determines its manner of interference and scattering. But it's the underlying structure that explains why the modulation exists. And it's the underlying structure that defines a locality and a trajectory for the particle, which are so this is just a model of a particle. It's a standing wave as, as de Broglie had, but you can see that, and these straight lines, transverse lines through it, uh, rep represent the, the, uh, the modulation. That's the particle, that's the modulation. So you can see that the full modulated structure locates the particle. Whereas if you just disappear the, the particle, the carrier wave, the standing wave. All you've got left is the all you've got left is the de Broglie wave, and that doesn't locate the the particle. So um, so the so the the curious wave functions that come out of the hydrogen atom. Um, I, I think the way to consider those is first of all compare. Compare the compare the Schrodinger equation approach with the Feynman path integral approach. Um, the importance of the, the Broglie wave is it defines the evolution of phase, and if along a trajectory. So if you have a trajectory, as you usually have in a Feynman path integral approach, um, even if he's considering lots of different paths, he's still considering the evolution of phase along those paths. Um, in a max ender interferometer, you um, you consider the you, you consider a well defined trajectory for for the particle, uh, and you have um, and in neutron interferometry these are, are massive particles. Um, excuse me. But when you solve the Schrodinger equation, there's no trajectory. The wave, you have a wave which can fill out the entire domain of the problem. And the result is, I think, the superposition of all possible trajectories noticed by Schrodinger. But I think if, if you have the mindset that there's no trajectory there and that the whole thing's probabilistic, you won't find a trajectory. But if you take the approach that I'm trying to convince you of, and you see that there could be a particle there, and that and that the, the modula and, and that the de Broglie wave is simply a modulation of that particle. Um, and look at the uh, look at the way the Schrödinger equation is actually solved. Well, the way it's solved for the hydrogen atom is you first of all separate it into um, coordinates, and then you take the space the, the spatial coordinates. The spatial wave, and instead of solving the three-dimensional wave, this being the standard undergraduate textbook approach, you solve the one-dimensional wave. And if it's a if it's a if it's a um, 
if it's a if you if you've got a problem with a problem where there's angular momentum, you simply take a equivalent uh, one-dimensional potential as you would in in studying gravity. And and um, and so you so you're solving a one-dimensional problem. So you're solving it for a one-dimensional wave and clues to the existence that there may be physically real trajectories in there are that um, when you take the second derivative of the of those waves, you get a wave vector, which is equivalent to a momentum. And you find that in those one-dimensional waves, you have points of inflection, which correspond to zero points of the of the momentum, which are turning points. So, so, and I think this is pretty well known, that there are, in fact, ways of finding well-defined trajectories in the hydrogen atom, and that the only reason that we don't think about that too much is that it's got this probabilistic uh, interpretation. Um, so I've written out here a number of other consequences, which um, I won't go through. Um, uh, I'll just finish up by saying that um, I'll just finish up by by reminding people of something that they already know, and that is that the people who who discovered who who are the main originators of wave mechanics, who I believe to be uh, Schrodinger and De Broglie and Einstein, never ever were comfortable with the probabilistic interpretation. It was the other lot, the, um, the Matrix people, uh, Heisenberg and Born and Bohr, who championed the, the, um, who championed the, championed the, um, the probabilistic theory. I mean, Einstein was famously unhappy with, uh, the probabilistic approach. Uh, De Broglie spent really a lot of the rest of his life looking for a, a realistic theory that would define a trajectory. And Schrodinger said that um, if he'd ever heard of quantum jumps, he would never have entered the profession, which which um which he did, happy, I'm happy to say. And that's and that I think is and there are some references. So so I point out that I I wrote a paper on this last month, which appeared in uh, Foundations of Physics. It's got a strange title called the Lorentz Transformation of Fishbowl. This this number four here, reverse engineering the De Broglie waves, got a listing of um, a listing of references from people. And the first reference is Wolf's Wolf's Wolf wrote a lot about this. He wrote a book on it, and. Uh, he deserved to be listened to, I think. And that's all. Question. Thanks for the talk. It was interesting. I couldn't follow it in full detail, but there's one question. Do you have a measurement problem in that view of the De Broglie wave? Um, does it solve the measurement problem? Um, no. Um, but what it does is, I think, what it could have done back in 1926 is create a frame of mind, a mindset, in which they would not never have accepted the probabilistic interpretation. Um, so, so that so the measurement problem, um, consider a um, consider a beam splitter. A beam splitter is three things. First of all, the way it the way it's the probabilities that emerge from it are always consistent with some with some uh, balancing of forces or conservation of some effect at the at in the in the beam splitter. There's always a scattering at, of particles in the beam splitter. If the particle went straight through, it wouldn't be a beam splitter. Um, and thirdly, um, 
if you insist on conservation of momentum and energy, there's got to be a reaction in the beam splitter to the change in whatever change is occurring in the in the in the particle. And if there's that reaction, it's occurring in all in all the scattering elements. So it's occurring in exactly the same place that the scattering occurs. And therefore the reaction, if it's going to if it's going to come back and burst, if you ran it in reverse and the particle emerged unchanged, it would have to be, it would have to have the same wave characteristics as the particle. So what you've got is the particle going one way and the reaction of the particle going the other way and emulating a particle in the other, in the other path. So you know, off the, that's how I think that it would explain the measurement problem because there's nothing to collapse. The two waves would recombine, and depending on whether they recombine with positive constructive interference or the other way, it'll go one way or the other, and, and there's no there's no collapse. The particle always goes one way. The reaction to the scattering of the particle goes the other way. They combine. Why the particle goes one way or the other is is because the uh, because of equilibrium in the in the apparatus. Um, I mean, if if let's say you had a a particle, um, let's say all the particles went one way, you'd immediately get in the apparatus a a reaction which would build up. Would would create a, uh, a a macroscopic imbalance in the apparatus, so this would be avoided by um, a process of equilibrium in the apparatus. So that's my uh, short answer. I have a quick question. Um, Thank you. How this connects for the Dirac equation. So, in, in the Dirac equation, in one plus one dimension, you've got this uh, sort of speed of light motion, and we've got this essentially a sort of a vagal. Which, right. So, so I'm wondering if you. Here's my modest opinion. The Dirac equation was created, as was the Schrodinger equation, as an equation for the de Broglie wave. The only difference is that. He introduced by the spinals, like by, by introducing. Well, in the in the modern way, you describe a Dirac equation is by the interaction of two counter propagating spinals. Um, so um, the Dirac equation is a a Schrodinger particle with spin. And it's created by counter propagating spinals. And everything that I just said applies to it in the same way that um, the same with the Pauli equation and the and of course the Klein Gordon equation, which is just the relativistic Schrodinger equation. Just a follow up then. So with the Dirac equation, you get particles, antiparticles, uh, you get. Um, I'm just wondering whether, because there's a lot more stuff that comes out of the Dirac equation. I wondered if you've got any insight into that additional stuff from this point of view? Um, well, so if you take a, a realistic uh, um, view of spin, so so what comes, what are particles and antiparticles? I don't think they, they come out of a sea of uh, antiparticles that always exist. They're just particles of opposite parity. Um, so in the Dirac equation, you've got... Uh, well, you've got four connected equations and you can write spin in there. You can write it either as particles and antiparticles, or you can write it as particles going going one way or the other way. So um okay. yeah. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Just to go back to my other questions. Let's yes. take a very simple case. We have a single electron and your reinterpretation of the Bohm's bones um, the voice wave is still a spread out wave, I assume. So if, um, we, if you want to detect a single electron at the screen, we still see, see a single spot. So, How do you make sense of that in your picture? So you have 
a particle and in some sense it's wave-like and when it's moving because of the failure of simultaneity a sinusoidal effect appears in it so it's yeah, yeah, the yeah, you have, you have a the De Broglie wave is coextensive with the particle, or coextensive with the fields of the particle. It emerges from the fields of the particle. It emerges in the fields of the particle. On top, on top of. Uh, no, no, you just have a particle. It's just, it's just a particle. It's, it's a standing wave. Think of it as a standing wave. Because of the Planck-Einstein relation, it's got a frequency, and because everything in, uh, in uh, under the Lorentz transformation must have offered the velocity c. You think of it as a standing wave composed of things that are evolving at. Uh, velocity c and I've got a frequency omega where omega is the characteristic frequency of that species of particle so in that sense it's it's spread the particle is spread but that a broy wave isn't it's just coextensive with the particle because it's no more than a phase modulation induced in the structure of the particle in this, in the rest frame of the particle there's no modulation, but from considered from another frame of reference, because of the failure of simultaneity, you you get this distortion going through the particle. Is that? I haven't answered your question yet, have I? Okay.